and welcome to Figment, Power of Imagination, episode whatever. We've had a lot of episodes. I think this is about my 40th Figments. And uh, as always, I'm pretty excited about my guest. Uh, today, I'm going to talk with Clint Churchill about the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, one of my favorite places, one of the best places on Oahu, and it's full of best places. Uh, so uh, before I do that, of course, I have to start with my opening rant. And the first one is a real from the news headline. Come on, man. The Biden administration is establishing a disinformation board, a disinformation board. And I'm a pretty middle of the political spectrum guy. But come on, man. If nothing else, who ever thought of that name? So you form your own opinion. Uh, watch a few of the interviews with the DHS secretary and other people. And if you don't say, come on, man, or come on, person, to be less gender specific, then uh, I don't know what you're thinking. But uh, I am a free speech absolutist, as Elon Musk said when he bought Twitter. The uh, second thing I'll talk about is Ukraine, Russia. Man, uh, it, it doesn't get better. Now we have a bunch of nuclear threats from the, so the former Soviet Union, from Putin and his um, mouthpieces, if you will, we have to take those seriously. Uh, I would not rule anything out of the realm of possibility from Vladimir Putin and those who help him government, govern, and I don't think there are many of those. I did, as you know, have Jim Haight, the CEO of Spirit of America, on my show um, a few weeks ago, and he talked about the non-lethal aid that we are seeing, uh, that they are sending from Spirit of America, like ballistic helmets. This is a Spirit of America donated helmet that saved a life in Ukraine. And verified by a U.S. military partner of Spirit of America, the only, the truly unique nonprofit that works directly with the military and the State Department. So I'm going to ask you to donate to Think Tech Hawaii too, but, but Spirit of America is doing some awesome work and I'd ask you to, to help them. So now to the real show, to Clint Churchill, one of the founders of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Aloha, Clint. How are you, man? Doing great, Dave. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, you are one of four founders. We're going to talk about the museum before, uh, before long, and that's pretty cool because it's a great place. I had my retirement dinner, as you know, there. But, but let's talk about you and let the audience get to know you before would they get to know the museum if they don't already? You're from Arizona. Uh, yep. I know you uh, went to college in Tucson. Arizona was home? What what part? Arizona's home, uh, born and raised in Phoenix, 1943. Um, my dad was a cotton broker, and uh, Phoenix was a small little town, yeah. less than 100,000, but uh, growing way up to public school, high school, and University of Arizona in Tucson. What, uh, what part of Phoenix, since I spent four years here at Luke Air Force Base? We're kind of right in the middle, um, halfway between uh, McDowell and Thomas Road, if you know. Sure, uh, absolutely. Right, right by Encounter Park. My dad moved, my folks moved to Phoenix, 1934. The city limits was Encounter Boulevard. How about that, Thomas Road? Uh, we used to, that brings back memories because I was driving past Thomas Road with my daughter, Yating, who's also a former guest, and her brother Thomas uh, wasn't in the car, but as I said, this is Thomas Road. She was probably five. She said, where's Yating Road? Because if there was a road name for a brother, I mean, why wouldn't there be a road name for her? There was quite a bit of cotton production back then, right? And agricultural land around what is now homes and businesses in Phoenix. Well, what empowered the, uh, uh, the valley there was the Salt River Project. And the building of uh -huh. three dams and uh, uh, three lakes, Canyon, uh, Roosevelt, Saguaro, and then the canals. So those canals brought water down that uh, basically uh, empowered all of that land. And, and cotton was one of the, the primary early crops, obviously, along with uh, oranges, uh, grapefruit, and so forth. If, you, if any of our viewers have watched NFL games like the Super Bowl in the stadium there, that was a cornfield. It was about a mile from my home when I lived there from 1988 to 1992. Uh, the area has changed a lot. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of warm, but as I like to say, you don't have to shovel heat. 
So you went to the University of Arizona and you studied business, but at the same time, you matriculated to aviation and eventually went to pilot training the Air Force. How did that happen? How did how did you connect with flying, or how did flying connect with you? Well, I, I uh, had an interest in flying during college. Had my uh, private license, um, and a, a fellow classmate in graduate school. I was at my fifth year, uh, working towards my MBA. Uh, he basically said, uh, "I was married at the time. I'd been married uh, oh, less than a year. What are you going to do about the draft?" And and uh, he started talking about the guard, and he was a pilot in the Tucson Guard. Took me out, I sat down on a briefing and got to learn about it and then uh, applied. Uh, guard units typically get one pilot training slot per year. So I applied and uh, got selected and, and off to pilot training about uh, oh, about 14 months after that. And you flew, I'm going to show a picture here of you in the cockpit of the F-15, an airplane we share history with. Uh, I flew the F-4, as did you, but you also flew the F-102. That's a pretty cool history. A thousand hours in the F-102, a thousand hours in the F-4, and almost a thousand hours in, in the F-15. And you and I have shared the story. We don't have to do it with our viewers, but those little milestones matter. And that had to kind of irk you to not quite get a thousand in the, the beautiful F-15 Eagle. Well, I was uh, yeah, very fortunate to, to uh, fly three generations out of five. We have fifth gen now. Uh, the, the 102 with a single seat, uh, basically interceptor, the F-4 two-seater, so you had the communication challenge with the back seater that ran the radar, yeah. and going back to, the, to a single seater in the F-15 was heaven, and plus all the technology that made it such a, a lethal uh, weapon that it is even to this day. Yeah, the F-15 is, uh, is an amazing airplane, even to this day, as you said, and I like flying single seat. I flew the F-4 with, a, with great backseaters as well, but my social skills made me ideally suited to single seat aircraft. So you're a lot more amicable than I am, but, but it's still different to try and communicate cockpit to cockpit. Uh, any single story from your fighter flying that you'd like to share? Did you ever get the daylight scared out of you? Oh, well, we all have a few stories. We really, uh... <laughs> Uh, rather not share if our spouses happen to tune in yeah. hour later. Uh, I guess the one that that uh, I recall, I'm sure you did several red flags, Cope Thunder. Yeah. I was fortunate and honored to be uh, involved with three red flags and a Cope Thunder. And maybe for these are major uh, training exercises. Yeah, yeah it's the Air Force's uh, uh, flag exercises where uh, you have a red force, a blue force, and typically 50 plus airplanes in the blue force and a big uh, strike package. Yeah, what occurred to me uh, when you asked that question is the time I was honored to be the mission commander of, uh, of a mission mm -hmm. at, at Red Flag at, uh, at Nellis. So all of that uh, uh, entails with uh, free strike recce, refueling. Planning, briefing, everything. Exactly, yeah. Uh, getting, getting all those pieces together as if it's uh, a real battle. And, uh, of course, what uh, Red Flag does is enables completely um, – uh, recasting and retelling what happened. Uh, the, the fog of war, you have a plan that never works out as planned because you've got someone else, uh, in that case, the Red Force, bringing uh, their defense on you. So your plan goes awry. And so how do you react? How do you adapt? How do you achieve the mission? Which in that case, of course, is uh, primarily escorting the fighters to, uh, to the target. Well, and that uh, there's no safe space on the on the podium during the debrief. If you screwed up as a mission commander, they're not going to package it with ribbons and bows. It's gonna be, you screwed up. Uh, that brought back memories of you know, my own red flag experience, which was in the F-4 back in 1973. But you haven't quit flying. I mean, uh, I know that because I've flown with you and my stepson Alejo has flown with you in your extra 300L, which is one of the most beautiful airplanes I've ever seen. This is uh, Alejo's flight card with all the aerobatics you did with him. And speaking of airplanes, there's a helo flying over the phase minus one studios here in Wailaiki. And um, man, you, Clint, you're a little bit older than I am. You really ring that bad boy out. Uh, why do you do that? It, 
you know, you, you can just cruise. Well, of course, Lang's in my blood, and uh, yeah. I retired from the Guard oh, about 26 years ago. I want to keep pulling G's and uh, kind of researched it. The extra 300 had just gotten its FA certification, so that enabled uh, commercial flights. So I could uh, sell rides and give folks right. first time aerobatic ride. So I opened up a little business called Acroflight Inc. And over the 20, uh, oh, 22 plus years that, uh, that I was active doing that part of it, I probably took up more than 800 folks, give them a first time flight experience. Uh, wow. And the extra with the, the powerful engine, the 300 horsepower engine, uh, uh, you can do things that you can't do in a jet. It's got- uh, Yes, you can. Gyroscopic effect of, of the engine. And it's a whole different world from fighter flying because a lot of negative G. So it's a different uh, uh, different kind of flying. I, this smile's left over from our flight about a year ago, I think. And uh, as I said, it was a moment in Alejo's life he'll never forget. And doing it in Hawaii with the beautiful backdrop. Incredible. Um, but you, you had a bit of a business from it. The other half of your resume that isn't flying is as a very sex, successful businessman. I'm not going to go into that much because um, I'm more interested in flying and I'm not a successful businessman. I started my own company and I like to call it a, an unintentional nonprofit because I'm, making money is not my best sport. But but you were, you were a very successful businessman, community leader, Campbell States, et cetera. And, um, uh, and that enabled you to uh, contribute not money, but expertise to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And we're going to talk about that right after I give a quick uh, shout out to next week's show. And I'm going to talk about my little concept, phase minus one, and talk about imagining planning for best and worst case. <laughs> if there's ever a time where you have to do both, it's now. Uh, phase minus one is the concept. I'll talk about it and give you some examples. And whether you're leading a business or a military organization, actually, I think it might be useful. Well, let's get back to Clint in the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Clint, I, as I said, that's how, how we got to know each other well, uh, both serving on the board, you as the boss of the board. Uh, but I love that place. Uh, it is where I had my retirement dinner now, many years ago, 2008 from the Air Force. Um, and it is, it's a phenomenal aviation and history venue, but you're one of the founders. Um, congratulations, first of all, having had a little bit to do with, with getting aircraft for display one at Luke Air Force Base in particular. I know just getting the airplanes is really difficult, but I never thought a museum here in Hawaii would succeed. So tell me about the lunch. We've talked about this, tell the viewers, about the lunch where the other three founders, um, and they were uh, John Sterling, Don Parent, and Admiral Ron Hayes, the late Admiral Ron Hayes, uh, got you into the mix there, not based on your exceptional flying background, but on your business acumen, right? Well, uh, that and the nonprofit background, I'd uh, mm -hmm. been involved and chaired a half a dozen or so uh, nonprofits to the Boy Scouts, the Coffee Lining Hospital, uh, and others. So one day, uh, working in my office out at uh, out at Coppola, uh, I get a call from uh, Admiral Ron Hayes, and he said, uh, "I think we'd like to to talk with you about an idea of an aviation museum on Fort Island." Uh, it had gotten to him through Don Current, who was the executive director of the Pacific Aerospace Museum at the airport, and in turn, mm -hmm. it had gotten to Don from John Sterling. Uh, John was connected with a, a previous effort that uh, uh, didn't go anywhere. Some fellows that came over in 1995, as I recall, for the, uh, uh, what would that have been, the, the 50th commemoration of the end of uh, mm -hmm. World War II. And they had, they had that original idea that needed a local board and local effort and, and, and the like to, uh, to be able to raise the funds to, to do it. So we got together for lunch out at Coalina and uh, talked about it and, and we said, uh, uh, number one, do you realize how much work this is going to be? Uh, and, and number two, uh, uh, we went around the table. I'm all in. I'm all in. We shook hands and and uh, said thereafter formed a, a new uh, corporation. Uh, got our 501c3, and and that's uh, kind of how it began. This is all in the 2000 
1999-2000 time frame. So what was the motivation? I mean, what, what drove you all to say, I'm all in? Because as you said, it's a lot of work in a well, location that that work w wouldn't necessarily be very easy. So what, well, aviation, what was it that drove you? Us, the uh, aviation was the missing piece at Pearl Harbor. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. you have the Arizona. Uh, the Missouri had only been there maybe uh, four or five years at that point. Uh, you had the Bofin submarine. Mm -hmm. but, uh, nowhere on Oahu was there uh, anything about aviation, yet aviation played such an important role in World War II and Korea and in Vietnam. We felt that if there was a need to, uh, to tell those, uh, those stories, uh, I think that motivated all of us, especially uh, Admiral Hayes, who was a combat veteran in Vietnam, uh, and, and with my, my uh, uh, air guard background as well. Yeah, Admiral Hayes, uh, as I uh, got ready for this show, I thought about, first of all, one of the nicest gentlemen you'd ever meet, um, a wonderful human being, and he only had three silver stars and seven distinguished flying crosses. And you would never know, because he'd never tell you. Uh, we miss him. We lost him about a year ago. We lost Admiral Ron uh, Zapslat for another fat, just fantastic guy uh, in just in recent days. And um, what what great what a great guy takes that kind of vision. And uh, as you said, there had already been a bit of a museum at the, at the airport, but it wasn't the same, right? That, that's correct. Just a small museum in the uh, city concourse there. Uh, the airport division was going to move them to a less desirable location. So, so the idea of uh, uh, kind of joining with, with the, the vision for Fort Island made sense to those that were involved with the Pacific Aerospace Museum. By the way, our first name uh, was the Military Aviation Museum of the Pacific. And that evolved uh, to Pacific Aerospace Museum. And that evolved to uh, Pearl Harbor uh, Aviation Museum. And you can see the location, the, the name matters, it was Pacific Aviation Museum, but this is at America's Battle, at the first point attacked in around Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. We're looking right, right at where the museum is today. You'll recognize the tower under construction and this picture was taken on December 8th, 1941. That's why I titled this episode, History You Can Feel. Every time I go to the museum, and I do that a lot, as you know, for board meetings and other things, uh, man, it, it, you can feel the history because you're right there. There are still bullet holes in the um, Hangar 79. This is where the world changed as America was drug into World War II. Did, so at that lunch was Fort Island and hang the two hangars we now have and the ops building, were they already presumed to be where this museum would be located or was that a That, that, a evolved, over the next, uh, that evolved over the next two years. Uh, there was special legislation passed in Congress refer, referred to Fort Island legislation to redevelop the island, mm -hmm. and make, uh, make use of uh, uh, hangars that were excess to the Navy's need needs uh, land, uh, not just uh, at Pearl Harbor, but also two remote locations, uh, Burkhoi Point and, and uh, out near Waikeli. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Navy was working through a, a request for a proposal, an RFP. And uh, so we worked hard to, to try to get in that uh, the, the preferred bidder uh, should have included a, a visitor attraction utilizing the three hangars and a control tower on Fort Island. So uh, uh, we were fortunate to be uh, included in two of the finalists that were selected. And then the Hunt Floor uh, final Fort Island Ventures was selected to be the uh, uh, master redeveloper of Fort Island. And there you are on Fort Island, easy problem solved, as we, we like to say in our household, every time we figure out something, it's problem solved, but problem not so solved because now you're a tenant of the United States Navy, and uh, God bless our Navy, it's still part of the government. And with the government comes a whole new world of regulations and oversight. Uh, 
was that easy or difficult at first? And how have you built the working relationship that the museum has uh, developed over the years? Well, uh, it's been challenging, but I think it's been a good working relationship. Yep. Uh, 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 sometimes frustrating because the, the commanders change. And uh, mm -hmm. Navy Region Commander, the, a one-star admiral, uh, uh, sometimes very supportive, sometimes not quite as uh, uh, actively supporting. So, so it, uh, uh, we had that aspect, but I'd say overall it's, it's been great. We're actually a sub lessee, uh, and it's really Hunt Building uh, Corporation mm -hmm. alone now uh, that, uh, that we work with. But yes, we have to continue working with the Navy uh, for approvals, and uh, that, that part of it overall has gone fine. Yeah, and, and right now, uh, over the years, it takes time to build this, but uh, thanks to Alyssa Lyons, the current executive director and the whole team, and to the Navy and the leaders that we've been blessed to work with here, it's as good as a relationship can get. <clears throat> Still have rules. We follow them. They help us follow them, but we work towards yes, if you will, in doing good things for both the Navy and the community. Um, so you have this incredible backdrop right there. And if you don't get chicken skin driving up the tower and seeing right now a C-47 up there, <laughs> and seek professional help because it's a special place. But you also need a backdrop to tell the stories. And the museum isn't so much about the airplanes as the history as much as you and I love to rub our hands along the nose of airplanes that we both flew. Um, but you got to have the backdrop. And here are a couple of the airplanes that uh, are on display right now. Um, the You started, I think, with five. I think you told me, right, right, Clint, the initial five. On the left, a P-40, and on the right, an F-15, like each of us, like we're both blessed to fly. There's a tower in the background. Uh, now we're up to 43 aircraft. Incredible. I I tried, I was, worked as the squadron commander of the world-famous, highly respected triple nickel. I have to throw in this pitch, America's greatest fighter squadron. Uh, to get a, a triple nickel Vietnam airplane all the way from Tucson to Phoenix, just to connect it with your story. And it took a year and a half, and it was not easy. It, it, all, we, and all we had to do was move the airplane. How, how you all have built this collection, I know because I'm on the board and served on the acquisition committee for a while, but it still amazes me. And you told me every airplane has a story, right? Uh, that that that's true. Uh, uh, probably the biggest uh, increment. I give a shout out to my friends at the Air Guard and uh, uh, General Pete Pauling. Uh, they had about yep. five uh, planes that were they call gate guards around the wing headquarters over at the mm -hmm. guard. Uh, two F eighty sixes, F one hundred two, and F four, and then later uh, uh, we got the F fifteen. So those those five came from the Air Guard. Uh, we've had uh, over the years a number of planes decommissioned particularly helicopters that can fly right in to Fort mm -hmm. Island. So 43 of the aircraft are helicopters. But of the rest, an uh, incredible number of stories. We started out with, with just one plane, that B-25, that was in fact uh, uh, on loan to, or in effect owned by the Pacific Aerospace Museum. So yes, that one start plane is- as, There it uh, is. Going to 43. And, and those, the five guard planes are great. We love them because they're, that we connect with them, but this is the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, and it tells the story of December 7th, 1941. It, it illuminates it, it. It's an incredible telling story. Can't do that without relevant airplanes. And the B-25 is special because uh, just about five months after the attack, uh, 80 years ago this April, uh, Jimmy Doolittle and 79 other brave men took off from the deck of the Hornet and uh, conducted a raid that really changed the course of the war. We can argue that. Historians, if you want to argue that, drop me a line at info at phase-one.com, but it was hugely important. So it had to be easy. You just brought that airplane over from Hickam, right? <laughs> well, that was quite a process. Not so much? That was quite a process to crane it over the, the fences and the hedges and to get it on a, uh, a barge at uh, uh, Bishop Point there at Hickam, and then on to Fort Island. But when we got it uh, to Fort Island, took the panels off, found it was so corroded 
that uh, it didn't make sense to continue trying to restore it. But fortunately for us, uh, uh, in Chino, uh, Chino uh, California, a place called Arrow Traders, uh, run by Carl mm -hmm. Scholl, owned by Carl, uh, we contacted him and he said, he's just finished up restoring a B-25. It'd be perfect for you guys. I'll have it done in time for your opening. And why don't you trade in the one that's so corroded and, and buy the one he's finishing. So that's what happened. So we had wow. effect, uh, a swap for the B-25 that's still in our uh, first phase in Hangar 37 today. And the rest of the airplanes in Hangar 37 that illustrate um, the opening days of the war include um, a Kate, uh, some remnants of a Kate, not fully there, uh, a Zero, and other airplanes that are uh, that tell the story, not just the the hardware. Um, and we're looking at getting a Val in, which would be one of the very few Val uh, bombers from the attack. So the air, the museum is doing extraordinarily well, uh, thanks to Alyssa Lyons leadership and the hard work of her team that the institutions come through the pandemic pretty well. And it's really, but I feel like right now, Clint, it's about to explode as one of the finest uh, aviation museums really in the world and become a, a centerpiece of a visit to Oahu and not something that you uh, go back, go to as an aside when you're visiting the other great memorials, the Arizona, the Missouri, the Bofin, et cetera. Um, what do you think? I, I, I'm really excited about the future. Well, absolutely. We're excited uh, uh, about two things, really. Uh, in December, we dedicated the Aviation Learning Center. Uh, yep. at, uh, it's geared for student kid uh, field trips, middle school, ideally, uh, a classroom, a, a room of, uh, kind of program text uh, stations. Uh, next room is uh, 10 uh, uh, flight simulators. You're actually flying and taking off of Port Island. You've got a Cessna 150 with chicken throttle and, and the yoke. And then the final room is an actual Cessna 150. We learn how to do a pre-flight. So we're excited about that, but uh, in, in about four weeks, we're going to finally get the uh, elevator open to the top of uh, the Fort Island Tower. Uh, that'll be quite a, uh, quite a. It's been three years in, in the making, and uh, a fair bit of money to get the, get that elevator restored. So uh, it, the view from the tower, uh, Freedom's view, we call it, uh, will be uh, uh, a cherished and much sought after yeah. uh, uh, item. Uh, there, there, there will be long lines to get up to the top of that. I'm sure of it because it is Freedom's view. The education center, those, is the go, shows the depth of the work that the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum does. There's so much put into the education of those who simply visit the museum, but especially the KK of the children of Hawaii and from elsewhere who have the opportunity to come and learn about history and learn about aviation. Um, and the team is driven to do that, to contribute to the community. And that's why uh, under your leadership and Alyssa's and now General Ray Johns, we've been able to get the financial support to do things like you described. Now we're repairing the, the historic Hangar 79 roof. And folks, just wait, come back in a year and come back again in another year. This is gonna be an amazing museum. Already is, only getting better. Uh, there are a couple other figments that you've had. We're almost out of time, which happens far too quickly when uh, if somebody like you has a great story. Um, but I want to talk about two of your other uh, dreams, figments. One is the Challenger Center that I didn't know about until you told me about it in the, in the prep for this mission, if you will. Uh, can you give me a quick 30-second, here's what the Challenger Center does? Uh, Challenger Center is STEM education, again, uh, focusing on middle school uh, science classes. So we've uh, converted uh, two classrooms into what, in effect, is Houston control and a spaceship, either going return to the moon or intercept Comet Haley. So the classes come in, get split up. The kids always have a, a different assignment uh, in pairs, navigation, communication, uh, experimentation. And they go through a mission, they have their checklist. Uh, we throw in emergencies. It's just a great learning experience uh, 
for the kids fortunate to have, have those field trips. Yeah, one of the best things that folks don't know about, they don't need to know about the schools and the children do, and that's really a, an incredible place. And I look forward to going out there and seeing it myself with my limited background in space as a former Air Force Space Command number two guy. Um, and then the Practical Policy Institute, Clint, you and I are both fascinated with things that work because as pilots, we know that things that don't work or don't work well are likely to kill you. Uh, this is, isn't life or death, but quickly, a uh, summary of the Practical Policy Institute, and you've been on Think Tech regarding that too. Uh, right, it's a new uh, uh, nonprofit, 501c3, that we incorporated in January. Uh, it's about climate change, uh, educating, uh, of and for the people of Hawaii and policymakers, uh, so uh, folks will have a better understanding of the climate system, uh, the practicality of Hawaii's uh, energy policies. How do we get to uh, dependable electricity that's affordable electricity from an intermittent source, a renewable source such as solar and wind? Um, uh, land use trade-offs, uh, it appears we're heading towards solar, more utility-grade solar, Going to take thousands of acres, so we think yeah. we should understand that. And finally, adaptation. Climate change is real, it's happening. Uh, we're going to need to adapt in the decades ahead, so we need to talk about that in a, in a practical way that works. And right. I applaud your efforts there. It's, it's not a denial sort of thing. It's no, it's going to work. Yeah, and I, I admire that. Well, thanks, Clint. Great talking to you. I'll see you at the uh, at the um, Challenger. Uh, center sometime soon. I'll see you in museum meetings because we always do. And when you get your uh, uh, extra 300 L out of uh, out of re well, let's see refurb uh, overhaul, uh, I'll come rub the skin at least and with you. So thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, always a pleasure, folks. That uh, leads me to the final thing. What would Pig do? Pig would go visit this wonderful Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum and feel the history, appreciate the history, understand what truly difficult times are like, and take some of the lessons from that era and apply them to your thinking today. It is an amazing place, and we've got some wonderful folks out there to, to help you feel the history. So coming up two weeks from today, pigments of the power of imagination, phase minus one thinking, planning for worst case and best case simultaneously. I would like to thank, uh, before I do that, let me show you the, uh, the QR codes for the two shows. Feel free to snap that, look on your phone, watch for your episodes, and please click like. I don't get paid for this. Nobody gets paid for this, but it does make me feel good. Now I'll thank Think Tech Hawaii and remind you that it is their the spring fun drive it's a wonderful nonprofit that allows citizen journalists like me to put on over 30 shows a week and express views on a variety of topics that inform the debate and discussion and make our state and our country a better place. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.